Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Super excited to be talking about AI and satellite imagery. We have Liz Durr joining us on the show. Hello. Hi, great Thank, to be here. Thanks so much for coming on. I'm really grateful to Lisa for introducing us. Yeah, that you, you guys were just in the hall, coming down, knocking on the door, and we're just like, yeah, we'd love to talk about <laughs> AI and satellite imagery. That's such an awesome field. And looking at your room, I can tell. <laughs> yeah, You're we, really into it. We are super into satellite imagery. It gives that macro perspective. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna be unpacking this in a lot of depth. Let's give Liz's background. She's the co-founder and CEO of Simularity, which uses AI to analyze satellite imagery. And you can find more information on Simularity.com as well, Simularity.com forward slash blog, which has more examples, greater detail, and also the Twitter is below as well. Liz, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions to ask our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? I, I think we're going to be understanding our world a whole lot better than we do now. Um, we are putting sensors everywhere and the amount of satellite imagery is, is growing at an astronomical rate, pardon the pun. <laughs> uh, but they're launching more and more satellites um, and the data is, is becoming a big flood of data because a lot of the analysis has been historical. Same thing with sensors. If you've got sensors in a manufacturing plant, you've got guys who, who listen to the sounds the machines make and go, oh, it just went kathud. It doesn't d usually do that. So as we add more sensors, we get a much better understanding of what's going on in our world. And I think seeing it from above, we get a better understanding of things that we really had no chance of seeing any other way. Yeah, on our uh, the human level perspective, there's the macro, the micro, the molecules, atoms, and then there's the macro, the cosmic perspective. So yeah, to be able to have the insight and like you said, the data flows are crazy. I think it's some, somewhere around 90% of all data creators created in the last two years, and it just keeps happening. It just keeps happening, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> to be able to analyze it and make sense of it, not only the internet, interwebs, and the internet of things, but also all of the satellite imagery. And like you said, there's so many satellites going up, and it's everything from those little bread loaf planet lab satellites to the big, you called it mainframe ones. And <laughs> yeah. they're now seeing outside of the uh, the, the visible light spectrum. Exactly. The, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So it's, um, when people think of satellite imagery, they usually think of pictures, you know, the RGB pictures that look like the other pictures that we look at. But satellite, satellites are now getting more and more sensors on board that look at uh, things other than the visible spectrum. And there's an awful lot we can tell based on these multispectral sensors on these satellites. And um, we're getting more and more uh, radar-based satellites that can actually shine a light in the dark to illuminate what you're looking for. It does that during the day as well. But now we can see in the dark. And now we can see through clouds uh, to see what's going on with synthetic aperture radar. Yeah, we're going to be unpacking that in a bit because it's, yeah, what a cool innovation to see through clouds, see at night, see outside of visible light spectrum. Whoa, yeah. whoa. Um, let's do Journey. I can't take any credit for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't make the, uh, the SAR. Yeah, yeah I, didn't, I didn't do that, yeah. But you're analyzing. We're, we're, we're making use of it, you yes. know, yes. really proving its value. Yes. So jumping into the journey, how did you become who you are today? Where did you pick up your interests? Teach us about you. Um, so uh, from an early age, I was great at math. And uh, I, there wasn't a whole lot of discouragement of girls in math at that time. So, you know, I got put in advanced classes. Uh, I had a great time with it. and. When I got to college, uh, my dad wanted me to study engineering because he's an engineer. And so I'm like, oh, okay. Um, but when I took my first computer science course, I'm like, this is beautiful. You tell it what to do and it does it. <laughs> it's so much more straightforward than the real world. <laughs> and so I really fell in love with the beauty of numbers and the, you know, just the utter simplicity and, and the ability to actually direct and control uh, 
creating something where you know you don't have to worry about hurting people's feelings and all these other things if you're working on something more concrete. So, uh, but uh, truth be told, in college, um, I was interested in meeting guys and smart guys. And so I hung out at the computer lab and then I realized that they were talking about stuff I didn't know. And I'm like, okay, I gotta fix this. <laughs> so, <laughs> an embarrassing origin story. <laughs> and then it was asking to learn and teaching them, kind of like, yeah, yeah. Well, at that point, I, I was more of an engineer than a computer scientist. Uh -huh. But I, I was just fascinated about computer science and the things that they were talking about. Um, and I'm like, I, okay, I'm going this way. Sorry, Dad, no civil engineering, uh, doing the computer science, science thing. thing. Yeah, intelligence is very attractive. The sapiosexuals attracted to the intelligence. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's so attractive. It's yeah. true, but there has to be so much more. Yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> the application of the intelligence into the real world, like, yeah, yeah, right. that's such a critical part. And um, my, my co-founder and I, um, Ray Richardson, he, has a degree in theoretical computing, and um, he uh, went to a school for that's got the Institute for uh, Man and Machine Exploration, and oh, cool. so he he started writing space-oriented programs, um, did some work at the JPL, uh, operated the operating system on the Mars rover. So he's got a lot of this background and is super intelligent, but doesn't do the business and the people part. And so I've got a computer science background, my degree is in computer science engineering, but I do the forward facing part. Yes, yes. And then how did it go from um, being fascinated with computer science to, uh, what was it, about a decade or more until you started Simularity? Oh, it was quite a lot, it was probably two decades. Two decades, and so it was, it was constant, um, uh, work in the computer science, so software, that style of yeah, work? Yeah, mostly application software. Application software. And um, as I was working in application software, I started to see the, the data tsunami and realizing <laughs> we don't have the tools that handle this. We, we just don't. And that really was the inspiration to go out and build this. Um, it's a great way to put it, data tsunami. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish I could claim that too. But <laughs> <laughs> it's such a good one. It yeah. is. Yeah. Um, and so we set out to, to build uh, artificial intelligence programs that could make sense of all this data. And we started in retail because I was working at a retail company at the time. Um, but we built it for massive scale because we were trying to solve this data problem. and. At the time, and this goes back more than eight years when we started this, uh, there wasn't so much data. It was just peaking, you know, just starting to take off. Um, but it turned out building an AI that can scale tremendously to, you know, hundreds of nodes and um, be able to, to analyze large amounts of data has a lot of applications. Yeah, so, okay, so then you were first starting in retail doing some yeah. of this, making sense of the data tsunami. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so then you were like, I like making sense of the data tsunami. I do. <laughs> it's, tell, it, tell us, we yeah. can learn so much. Um, you know, with AI, we've discovered like thousands of new species because it can go through and, and look at samples, uh, you know, in the water or in the wildlife and find things that we've never found. So. There's so much more we can learn about this world. And uh, that's what really excites me. Oh yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah, the computational capacity, like you were saying, to be able to say, oh, do this, and then yeah. it's done through the computer, yeah, yeah, versus having a, yeah, in the physical world with humans, is, it could be, can be a lot different. <laughs> <laughs> so then how about the moment for you where you, were, you wanted to start uh, Simularity? How did that start? Um, so I've known uh, my co-founder, Ray Richardson, for more than 30 years. I met him in college, uh, and we went different ways for a while, and then we came back together, and um, we were constantly talking about, you know, how, how we can improve the world, what we could do, and I told him, you know, at work I've got this problem where we've got way too much data, 
and I'd like to make some sense of it. And he says, I know how to do that. So yeah. <laughs> that's kind of where it started. And um, we got married. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Th well, thank you. Yeah. And um, uh, we just passed 10 years of being together and working together every day on this kind of stuff. Nice. And we love it. Yes, that's great. Yeah, you guys can work together on a, on a pa passion project. Yeah. Yeah, that's super important. You yeah. Know, and, that's and like two minds on the same. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, he's like, I love so much that you can actually understand what I'm saying. Yeah, 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 yeah that's so important. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so we basically do design together, and I do a lot of the gathering of the customer input and kind of say, okay, this is what we need to build, and he goes off and figures out how to build it. And so, okay, this has been eight years of yes. building this. That's a, okay. This is a while. So since 2011. Yes. Okay. And well, then we actually started before 2011 and then I went full time in 2011 because we had a product. Yeah. So it was two years of nights and weekends mm. uh, before I, I actually went full time on this. So it's been a long time. Yeah, and there were a lot less uh, satellite images in 2011. There were, there yeah, were. And less satellites in general, and now there's more, and there are only going to be more, so applications like this into the space economy are, are very exciting. It's going to be right. huge growth over time. And, and the, the geo-intelligence community is screaming out for better tools to automate. Um, because the, tool, the tools that they have now assume that it's a single person working in front of a computer that's doing the analysis and looking for the changes. And there's no way that you can keep up with what's going on. I mean, we talked to a, a very large company who uses satellite imagery to analyze their um, remote locations. And it took them a quarter. They would get imagery quarterly and have this whole fleet of analysts spend an entire quarter looking at it to determine what was going on. And it's like, this isn't gonna scale, you know? Did you, see, did you see the change in this area of pixels over there over the four month period? And well, exactly, <laughs> that's, that's way too late to actually do something about it generally. Um, so being able to, to see the imagery more frequently, there's um, at least one uh, company that's imaging the planet every day. Um, Whoa. Yeah. The whole planet. The whole planet. With um, a fleet of satellites. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. At a, they call them constellations. A constellations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Constellations of satellites. Yes. Yes. Um, fleet. <laughs> yeah. Well, they are kind of airships. But. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, and then an everyday image to a certain resolution, right? Yes. So they're constrained by resolution exactly. still. Exactly. Okay. Um, because the, the constellations, each one is easier to produce. Um, but that's because you don't have the, the resolution of the super expensive cameras that um, need, need a lot more power and... Uh, it, it, it can be really challenging, but com countries around the world, and we're seeing a lot of this being sponsored by countries, um, are launching their own satellites, uh, and in some cases putting them in geosynchronous orbit over their country hmm. so that they can keep a better eye on the country. Most of the satellites uh, kind of roll around the Earth and map it that way. So if you're in... L low Earth orbit is—is mm -hmm. is that like within 250 miles? Oh, what well, ish? Let's <laughs> yeah, just say. So, yeah. so, but then there's about a 90-minute orbital period. Yes. Okay, and then that's like the International Space Station has a, that yeah. orbital period, mm -hmm. and then geosynchronous is like 400 miles or it something is. out. And then it is. with geosynchronous, you can actually keep it orbiting with the Earth. Mm -hmm spin on its axis mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it can literally just be looking at one location right. and just constantly be looking at that location right wow that's great well yeah <laughs> it really is and there's only more to come right uh so going back to your original question i really think that this is the age of learning so much more about our world and i can't wait to see where it takes us um and the, the way medical uh, technology is changing, 
we might be around to see some of the really interesting stuff that comes out. Yeah, yeah, ex yeah, totally. Uh, the, to be able to see how, how civilization does in the yeah. next couple decades, hundred years, oh, would be God, very exciting. Oh, yeah. God, I want to be here for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay, we have some awesome uh, slides and images to share. So... Okay, similarities using AI, SAR. So SAR was the aperture, say, say that again. Synthetic aperture radar. Synthetic aperture radar, which lets us look through clouds and do 3D modeling of buildings and, and stuff like that. And basically the radar itself is a source of light. And so we can look at things at night because okay. it's supplying its own light. In regular imagery and multispectral imagery, we use the sun as a light source. Yes, yes. Okay, so when when the half of the earth does not get sunlight and there are satellites on that half of the earth then if they have uh s s satellite aperture Sar sa synthetic, synthetic aperture, aperture radar yeah and there's a good explanation of that in our blog in your blog and then they can they can provide the light on that on the dark side yes. of the earth for yeah. being able to image it yeah from the actual satellite it provides yeah. the light yeah and it doesn't take that much energy for the satellite to do that? I, it's not cheap, so it's not, it it's probably expensive. does take some energy to do that. Okay. And what they're doing is, is shining a, a radar beam onto the Earth and measuring the reflectance wow. as the fre frequencies come back. And based on the variation in the reflectances, it can produce imagery um, based on uh, what they do is they can send out horizontal or vertically polarized light and then can get back different horizontal and vertical polarized light and be able to, to create an image out and of that. create an image out of that, okay. And then um, optical imagery, find the unusual, the invisible, and the hard to find. Okay, cool. Now you guys are based out of uh, Point Richmond over on the, on the East Bay. Over in the East Bay. Great. Okay, so, and you guys have a YouTube channel too. Just that's we do. another good thing. YouTube.com yeah. forward slash similarity. Check that out, everyone. Great videos there. Yeah, great videos. Okay, so um, I think some of the important things that we're going to talk about in here are the, the most important things, probably the exact use cases mm -hmm. of it. Um, so, right now, a lot of uh, military movements, smugglers, rebel camps, illegal shipping. Um, the valuable insights that we can get from other aspects of well, the, how our climate is changing, yes. um, these types of things. Deforestation is a big one. Deforestation. Okay. So manual analysis, you spoke to that earlier about how it's really hard to have teams of analysts just looking at an image that's changed after a three month period when the data flows are so great. Exactly. So to be able to have something like your software being able to parse it. And if you're trying to stop smugglers or stop deforestation, you need to be able to tell that it's happening now and send people out, right? Finding out that you know you lost 10,000 hectares over the last four months, not so useful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like we know it happening now, go tackle it yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, interesting that there's something uh, illegal happening, that there is a, some sort of human trafficking or antiquity trafficking or whatever happening that... What about poachers? Can you spot a poacher killing a rhino or an elephant and then Ooh. shoot a laser beam down? And <laughs> <laughs> That last part, everything was, and then exactly, Rob was just like, exactly. can I shoot the laser beam down? Well, you got to do something about it. You just can't say, hey, stop what you're doing. Yeah, but the but laser beam part was you, good. You, you, you probably need a, a UAV for that. I don't think the oh, laser beams from the satellite are going to work, but we do analyze UAV images too. I can work on that for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah just hire Ron for making the lasers. <laughs> destruction, anything <laughs> destruction. <laughs> Okay, so you, but then you also can take UAV. Okay. Exactly. So these, um, and that's uh, an un, unarmed aerial vehicle? Un, unmanned. Unmanned. Drones. Unmanned aerial vehicle. Yeah, drones. And then they fly at about the commercial airliner yeah. level? Yeah. Around and, that. I mean, they can go up and down, but yeah, they're, they're in that airspace. Okay. And you can get super amazing resolution using the UAVs, but it obviously takes a lot longer because they're small and you've got to go back and forth to cover an area. Okay, yeah, okay. So then 
so then you also take images from UAVs? We do. We can actually okay, take cool. any kind of um, geolocated imagery. And with the UAVs, they know where they are. And that information gets passed into the imagery. So we can actually do something that nobody else is doing and line up images of different resolutions to look at a historical context from the, the images of super high resolution like you get from a UAV to super low of, uh, resolution like you get from some of the, flea, the free uh, satellites that are out there and put them all together. And our software can resolve that and look for differences in this major set of images. Because one of the problems that's happening right now, there's one company imaging uh, the Earth every day. There's another that's trying. But they're doing it in different resolution. And then some of the higher resolution satellites will come every two days or every three days. And if you're looking at you know, a, a tropical country, if it's covered with clouds, they skip that place a lot. So. Oh being able to get a better understanding of what's actually going on you've got to come up with a set of images that are are all relevant for the place you're studying and then you know stretch or shrink them so that they can stack on top of each other and we can look for anomalies okay okay so then you can have uavs just a couple miles up versus the 200 miles up yeah um, getting potentially greater resolution you can stack those images on top so we'll get uh -huh. to the that historical context on yeah our, um, the, so AIADS, mm -hmm. Automated Image Anomaly Detection System. Yes. Okay. That's, okay, that's a cool acronym. So you're looking for the anomalies in this historical context that we're about to show. Exactly. Okay, cool. And you can take input from satellites or drones, then you run it through the Automated Image Anomaly Detection System, and then mm -hmm. on the output you share the anomaly files, you send notifications to people, and that's usually the process. Right. Okay. And the AI in AI ADS, uh, it stands for automated image, but it also stands for artificial intelligence, and that's where we're building our predictive models. Yes, yes. Okay, cool. And then this is, this is like really the beautiful uh, image that I'm super excited for you to explain. Great. So um, typically, change detection looks at two different images and basically subtracts one from the other to show you what's different. What we do is look at historical images and create a predictive model of what it should be. So here we've got four images, November, January, April, and May of this same area. Now we got a new image, let's pretend here, um, and we want to know how does that compare to the historical images? Are yes. there any differences in here that I should be looking at? And based on the predictive model that we've come up with here, we highlight these changes in red. And so this image is basically just the anomaly heat map laid over the current image here yes. with the red parts highlighting exactly what has changed. Yes. But you can see here the color of the graph, the grass changes, yes. um, the reflections change, and we learn that all that is normal change and we're not going to bother anybody looking at brown grass that used to be green. Yeah, yeah. This is crazy. How do you, how do you know if it's a change, like you can tell here that, that, that these have changed quite mm -hmm. a bit mm -hmm. between these two, um, the earlier images and then the uh, candidate image that yes. you're using to compare yes. it to. And you can see it's also made a change over here, right? So this mm -hmm. is where the red is on your, mm -hmm. on your heat map. Mm -hmm. How do you know if it's uh, you know, grass changing colors? Or I mean, you're going to give the example later where a tunnel was dug, right? right? So it's like, how do you know that it's just a different color of brown versus if something's happening? Yeah. So this is where the analysts come in. And um, the, the geospatial analysts need these tools to highlight what this is. And then they go in and look and say, oh my god, that's an airstrip. <laughs> um, okay. They've got a lot of expertise in understanding what the heck it is that we're looking at. So what we're doing is calling attention to the things that are important to look at. Got it. They do the analysis to figure out, you know, is that a school bus or a, a, a tanker or a wow. pickup truck full of rebels. Wow. Okay. 
Great, great. Okay, so this is also similar to the medical industry as well, where we're looking at all of the bodily scans and that it's uh, it's like a flag that happens, and then the the, the we still use a physician, exactly. to, an, an analyst, a medical analyst, to say, okay, this flag was yes, great, exactly. great catch. Okay, so then so then you're using the um, geo uh, uh, analysts that are still looking at the red um, the red uh, anomaly heat maps, and mm -hmm. they're saying what exactly. So sometimes there are uh, instances where it's like, ah, uh, no, we think that may just be something, but now that that looks like a new parking lot. A new parking lot. Okay. Right? Okay. Uh, we, we can tell some of those things, and one of the interesting things about parking lots are. If you've got an active parking lot um, you know, at a mall or something like that, uh, we learn that having cars in that parking lot is totally normal. So even if it's different colored cars on different days, we don't flag those as yes. anomalies. Yes. If there's a parking lot that's usually empty and then there's cars in it, oh, we yeah. flag that as an anomaly. So this historical context gives you the ability to see things that you wouldn't have necessarily noticed are anomalies. It's just like, oh, that's just cars. But if there didn't used to be cars there, that means something. And then can you explain the, the RGB side of this. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, I, I use RGB to basically refer to the visual spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, images that, uh, that we can see in red, green, and blue like we see on our monitors. Yes. Um, and the visual spectrum is actually just a small piece of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum um, have different frequencies. And a lot of what we measure here, the way cameras work and this works, is you, you shine a light on something and measure what's coming back. And that's the same with the different electromagnetic frequencies, is you can shine that on something and look at what's coming back and make some determinations based from that. And if you've got um, sort of a wide uh, number of multispectral bands, th there are indices out there that are basically math between the reflectance and the bands that can tell you this is asphalt, uh, this is a palm tree, um, there's metal that we detected here. Uh, it's being used for mining. It's, it's being used for a lot of things because different things reflect differently at different bands in the spectrum. Interesting. And so we're learning so much more. And if you're really curious about what's going on somewhere, uh, you can find out through this combination of multispectral imagery and visual imagery. And we use the multispectral imagery in the anomaly detection. And yes. so we've seen images where um, two factories, they look exactly alike in the visual spectrum, but one is, is giving off some kind of gas that's invisible in the visible spectrum, but shows up very brightly in uh, the multispectral analysis that we do. Whoa. And so yeah. it, it's really cool. Okay, so then we have the normal, on the electromagnetic spectrum, we have the normal visible light that we're using to, to analyze, and then we also have the multispectrum, everything all down to infrared, all the mm. way up to, um, to gamma and yeah. x-ray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, you're, so you're, um, you're then able to take uh, all, all, both of those, the visible light and the multispectral, and analyze that as well. Yes. Wow, okay, and then, and then um, the the okay, so the, the you gave that example, which was really interesting about like gas coming out from a factory. That's mm -hmm. a really interesting one that you can't necessarily see with visible light. Right, it's a pretty cool one. And then um, also, it's another probably interesting one for visible um, light would be that when you see those ten thousand hectares of, y of exactly. forest just gone, um, you need to call someone in, like. Before now. ten thousand disappear, exactly. And say, yeah, yeah. Go and investigate what is happening. Exactly. Our um, one of our clients uh, lives in a place where there's a lot of illegal deforestation going on, and um, the people doing the illegal deforestation are heavily armed. 
Because uh, wow. they know they're doing illegal activity, right? And that people are going to try and stop them. And so it's not necessarily a simple problem of going up and say, hey, stop chopping down those trees. Um, it, it can actually be fairly dangerous. Yes. And so being able to, it, to know where they are, when, what they're doing, um, when they're moving, it, it gives uh, the, the police or whoever is working on solving these problems the, the intelligence they need to know to be able to go in and stop it without getting slaughtered. Yeah, yeah, those insights are huge. Now, w is the multi-spectral analysis also then able, like you were saying uh, a little bit ago, that, you, that there's a certain way that um, metals ref ref reflect, reflect differently. differently. Yeah. So then you can actually do things like see where the metal is in the forest to see yeah. where the yeah <clears throat> where they are so um one of the one of the problems that we're working on addressing uh and we have a prototype of now that's looking really good but it's not public ready um is finding human activity in forest canopy under forest canopy um a lot of bad guys hide out in the forest and do their smuggling or drug making or whatever it is somewhere away from prying eyes. Um, we wanna be able to find that. And so if you take a, a visual image, you get trees. Yeah. 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 <laughs> get the canopy of trees. Exactly, yeah, yeah. you get the canopy of trees. You can't really tell much at all. Um, with multispectral, you can tell the health of the trees. You can tell if somebody's been you know, burning fires and damaging leaves, things like that with multispectral. Nice. But with SAR, it can actually penetrate the canopy and find reflectance off of metal objects. Damn. So, um, and bad guys tend to have a lot of metal objects. Yeah, damn. And then, so then also for like um, mining and for other uh, uses as well that, uh -huh. that you can see with multispectral, you can see um, the way that other metals are moving. Yes. Well. Um, yeah. And if, you know, particular surfaces are rich in certain kinds of metals. Oh, interesting. The surface. Yeah. 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 Their, their richness. Yeah. In those metals. Yeah. Um, but an, another example in mining is um, watching how the earth around where the mining is happening is behaving uh, and being able to detect cave-ins, for example. Um, because SAR can be incredibly accurate, you can use a thing called interferometry, mm -hmm. which measures the interference that's coming back. And that can be really quite precise in telling you changes about the earth. And um, it's, uh, we're not doing interferometry yet, but that's kind of one of the next things because it's such a great source of information. If you're looking at the surface of, of the earth or other things where they are being deformed and you want to see what's happening. Okay. Oh, interesting. So uh, potentially sea levels changing. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, subsidence like, um, uh, uh, Island sinking. Island sinking, that type of stuff. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, cool. Cool, cool. Um, interfer interferometry. Yes. Interesting. Okay. Okay, okay, cool. I loved I love this this example so great and it's um it's to totally speaks to being able to use um, AI apply to um, uh, historical context to analyze all the yeah, data. Yeah, and so what, much. What we're actually doing there is creating a predictive model for every single pixel. And there are hundreds of thousands, maybe hundreds of millions of pixels in some of these images. So we use that computing power to do something that it seems kind of crazy. A predictive model for every pixel. So you're, you're, you're saying, okay, well, it's looked like this, it's looked like this. Holy cow, it's changed a lot. Yes. And it's not what we predicted it looked like. So exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because sometimes with seasons, too, you can start predicting that it's going to look like this over exactly. a span of a year. And so if it's changes at any point over that year right. to something that's not familiar. Right. So you create a predictive model for every pixel. That's crazy. It is crazy. Yeah. And um, it... it 
couldn't be done without the cloud computing capacity that's available today. Yeah, thank goodness for cloud computing capacity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but then, but then, what's nice is you can take an area like this and say that okay, well, this whole chunk of pixels is is going to have a pretty similar predictive model. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, because it's all green. Exactly. It's all like that. Okay. And this is all buildings. It's all going to look about like that. And, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. All right. All right, so um, you, we kind of we kind of unpack this, um, mm -hmm. and this is you also you kind of spoke about this as well I in did, the next I yeah did. okay great great okay and um, so this I'm really excited about this is what we've got prototyped right now is <clears throat> not only are we finding metals in the woods but if we're looking for rebel camps. Um, they typically cook on an open fire. Mm. They generally don't have any vehicles. Um, they generally move in single file. They're marching if they're moving. We can create rules uh, that apply to, is this a rebel camp? And then use the data that we're getting out of the imagery, right? Did we see metal reflected? Did we see something, you know, damage to the trees from the open fire cooking, yeah. right? And with a rule set, put all that together and say, this is probably a rebel camp. Yeah. Or this is probably a school, yeah. right? Yeah. I, important to know the difference. Yes, yes. Well, so this is cool. So you can then start setting um, the parameters as well and saying that, okay, well, we are seeing, if you see these three things, yes. then likely it is this. And so exactly. then you can get that um, a faster parsing of the data. Well, and we can provide more insight. Provide more insight, yeah. Provide yeah. more insight faster. So, you know, we talked about the analyst having to figure out whether that's a parking lot or not. As we are able to develop more rules to apply to what we're looking at, we're going to be able to help them even further. Yeah. Um, in no way are we placing analysts. Yeah. Just want to make that clear. And same thing <laughs> with the physicians exactly. in the medical industry. Yeah, yeah. That exactly. We still need them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's augmenting, augmenting exactly. the work. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, making them more productive. Yes, yes. Okay, so this is synthetic aperture radar. Yes. Seeing the hidden. It's yes. The Peru's Pacaya Samiria National Reserve. Yeah, um, and this one is from uh, NASA JPL with a UAV SAR. So they're actually flying SAR on a drone for this picture. Mm -hmm. But what we're seeing in this forest here. If, if you just looked at the visible spectrum, it would look like trees and vegetation. But what we're seeing here is some of this ve uh, vegetation is inundated with water. So oh. the dark green is low vegetation that could be floating. Uh, the pink and red are different types of inundated vegetation. Um, inundated with too much water? water. Wow. And then here... Because um, of a flood or something? It could be. could be a flood. It could be a flood. Um, somebody could be way over watering their crops. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Um, but, and then the, the grayish green is tropical forest. And so SAR helps you see how these different things are reflecting and can tell you basically what's going on with this foliage, this vegetation uh, that you wouldn't be able to see any other way. And it's, it seems as though then the importance of, 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 of something like this is like, can you, can you see things? You, you, like you said in the earlier, you're see, seeing the hidden. Yeah, I see it again yeah, here yeah. at the very beginning. That's very cool. Um, then also just, um, are you then looking at the, uh, the water levels that are, have, that have, how do you know it's inundated the, 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 the plants and the crops, how do you, how can you tell with SAR that it's done that? So um, just like there are uh, indices in um, multispectral imagery that tell you what's going on, people who study SAR imagery create these index indices to tell you if you're seeing this in the reflectance pattern that you're getting back, it means it's inundated vegetation. In, in the reflectance patterns that you're getting back. So right. the radar goes at night. It, it can go anytime. It can go during the day too. And yeah. then depending on the reflectance pattern that you get back, 
is yeah. how you can predict that. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, there's so much technicality that I still want to unpack, but we'll have to do that on another um, sit down together to okay. get into the nuance about how that actually works on a technical side. Um, okay, and this was really interesting. Okay, teach us about the uh, um, NDVI. Right, so NDVI, uh, Normalized Difference veg Vegetative Index, is a very standard index that's used across the industry, but it's a great demonstration of how using multispectral imagery can give you information. So we've got three images here. One is just a visual spectrum RGB image. That doesn't look like much. In fact, it's maybe even hard to tell that there's crops there. Yeah, it does look hard. It looks like the crops were already harvested in that. In that yeah. yeah, or dirt or something. Or dirt, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when you look at it in just the near-infrared band, you can start to see detail. Crops, uh -huh. yeah, okay. When you combine the near-infrared band with some other bands you, for this NDVI index, what you're getting here now is a very clear picture of the crops, and healthy crops reflect differently than unhealthy ones. Oh, interesting. And so uh, a common gradient is red to green, where red um, is unhealthy, uh, crops and green is healthy crops. So the, the fact that what we see is this, but the electromagnetic spectrum can help us see this and make determination about the crops, really super useful. And it's, it's stuff that we can't see with our own eyes unless we create things like this. So you're doing the multispectral analysis and you're also kind of, co you're combining different multispectral analysis? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. okay. And we do anomaly detection on this. So let's say uh, this is a candidate image. Uh, we can use historical images and then compare the NDVI over time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Create the predictive model there. So okay, cool. in, in all of these cases, we can look at the historical context, see how things are changing and flag unusual changes. As long as you have an, a historical context of an NDVI image over time, which is, well, the, that's a lot of data again. It's and, a, it's, <laughs> it's a, it needs to be a multispectral image that you can calculate NDVI from. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are a lot of those and, and people are building cool. more. Uh, but it's not the image the planet every day kind. So then um, you'll get um, mostly uh, RGB images for our satellite imagery for now. And then multispectral imagery is coming in hot and there's a lot of data coming in that. And then you can, from that, you can make historical context of of an NDVI as well as an RGB, so then you can analyze exactly. on different, yeah, yeah, okay. And, okay. and NDVI is just one of maybe hundreds of different indices that can tell you different There's things. hundreds of different yeah. um, indices for yeah. imagery? Yeah, that can predict pavement, uh, you know, identify pavement, um, certain metals. Uh, it can even see through some of the water and look at things like coastal erosion and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So um, there's really an amazing amount of stuff. And so we take that data build pred predictive models around it, and then can say, it looks like your crops are dying, or yeah. something like that, where yeah, yeah. You know, they used to be healthy, but then you started watering them too much in July, and now they're waterlogged and don't look so good. Mm -hmm. This so it takes me all the way back to what you said at the beginning, where you're just like, we're gonna, we have so much data, so many sensors, we're gonna just know so much more about the planet that we live yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then most of the clients are using you guys as a SaaS. Uh, we do both. Okay. Um, the on-premise software is essentially being used by classified uh, clients. Okay. Um, and that means like military. Exactly. And, yeah. Okay. And then, are there also um, uh, companies that like that use it for? Uh, um, you, like, are there, are there, can you, can you, is there like a, um, like a normal Fortune 500 company that uses it as well for some of their basic needs? Um, so, uh, there are other companies that provide analysis for Fortune 500 companies that do things for their basic needs. Um, the CART Labs is really good with Descartes logistics. Labs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, cool. What we're really helping them do 
is make the analysts more efficient. Yes. And um, yes, correct. In a in a classified context, that really matters a, a, an awful lot. And they get way more imagery than anybody else, right? We have friends that uh, analyze imagery for um, for different governmental organizations, and that they uh, have that as something that that they literally get so much of the, so many images, and to be able to have something like you saying look at this with our historical context. These are the areas to specifically look at. Don't waste your time on, yeah, on other and things. And that actually brings up an interesting origin story. OK. Um, yes, please. So uh, <laughs> Let's do the origin story. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were, we were uh, focusing on change detection, you know, building these predictive models and detec detecting changes and anomalies. And uh, we. Uh, captured the attention of a Saudi Arabian prince who wanted to bring that technology into his country. Um, and he's sort of a, a tech savvy guy. And so there's a handful of, of companies that he's brought into Saudi Arabia. And one of the other com uh, companies happened to be there at the same time we were there and had had a sales call that had not been too inspiring. And uh, uh, Jamie, our contact said, <laughs> we get this call, we're, we're in the bedroom, it's like 11 o'clock at night in this hotel in Riyadh, and Jamie's like, come down to the lobby. I've got a great idea. So <laughs> wow. <laughs> so he introduced us to this other company, uh, who shall remain nameless. Um, <clears throat> and their problem was the, the generals and the people in the, in the um, military were saying, we can't analyze the stuff we get now. You know, we don't have t time to go through all yeah. this stuff. I'm not gonna buy all your imagery because I don't have anybody to look at and I don't have the time. Unless you can come up with some sort of automated way to help us, you yes. know, uh, identify this imagery and what we need to look at, I'm not buying your stuff. Yes. And we went, wait a minute, we could do that. Yeah. We could totally do that. And uh, that's where it started. I love that. It's such a good <laughs> one. Is that, yeah, the, the moment of someone uh, saying, yeah, make, making the life easier uh, for analysts. Um, to where, where's the pointer? Where should we look? Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and, you know, client and partner list, of course. Um, we kind of went over some of these already, um, but specifically, we're about to get to an interesting example with tunneling. Um, yes. I'm, I'm excited to show that one. Yeah. Okay. But this is, oh, this is one more of what a classical. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This, yeah. Is, this is like, uh, there's so much yellow, where am I supposed to look? Exactly. This is a, a change detection result where you're just looking at two images. And those two images can vary a lot in ways that are not important. And this actually is our anomaly heat map on top of this same area. And what it found here is a new roof. And you can see it here. And you can see it really clearly here yeah. that there's that difference. And so lots faster to figure out what happened yeah. this yeah, way. Yeah, because that other one was just looked like a cloud. Like this one just looks like a cloud of yellow. And it's so hard to be able to pick stuff. And exactly. then when you come to this one, you find um, very quickly that that's the new hop, the new roof and that exactly. yeah yeah that's great and you know new roofs might sound fairly mundane but there's an enormous amount of illegal construction that happens all over the world and like whose plot of land is that and you know did well, they okay that construction well exactly yeah. maybe they got a permit for a one story building and they built a three story building and didn't build it to code. And didn't build code, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Because a lot of illegal construction not necessarily built to code. Why would they? Yeah. Um, yeah. So finding uh, illegal construction and um, making sure it gets up to code or it gets taken down or the owner you know, pays appropriate property taxes, uh, a really compelling use case for cities and municipalities that are trying to you know, yes. get a hold of this. Yes, yes. And then this example is also so, so crazy. So this is the um, Israeli Defense Forces yeah. on the left. Um, they, 
they've been looking at, and have found, um, this is the fourth uh, Hezbollah cross-border terror tunnel that they've found. And um, they're not using our software yet. Um, but uh, the um, entrance was found near Ramye. Yeah. And here's an illustration of that. And what we're going to do is uh, l look at the site where the, the digging happened yes. up here. Yes, so this is the, um, uh, the West Ramye where there's the, yeah. you, you called it a, a, a t t t tunnel, t terror tunnel. Right. Which is crazy that you can bear, go right under a wall that's constructed and to be able to use something like this to detect that. Is, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, that blue line was the border and you could see that it crossed under the border. So here are two pictures. Um, an earlier picture and a more recent picture of that area. Um, the, the tunnel entrance was actually found in the wooded area. It's crazy that it was found there, yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, the thing that showed up to us that, made, that gave us a hint that there was something going on. Um, <laughs> and there's no way that an eye, I think, could catch this so easily. No. Yeah. There's a big pile of dirt here. Yeah, and if we go back, if you, you go can see, back, you can see the big pile of dirt, but it's pretty subtle when you're looking so at everything subtle. else around. And so there's a there's a dark looks like dark brown with some uh -huh. green here, but this looks like freshly dug up it does. dirt. And then when you go to the next image, your anomaly exactly. detection is saying, "Look at that!" Yeah, yeah. And if you're digging a tunnel, you're moving dirt and it has to go somewhere. Yeah. And so uh, something like this is a really good clue that uh, illegal activity may be happening. And if you don't discover that tunnel uh, for a couple of years, you're going to wonder how, how is it that people are getting into the... Oh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. So. Oh, yeah. 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 Tunnels under borders are big problems. Yeah, oh, well, let's get to that world peace, everyone. Well, it all depends on what side you're on. <laughs> I just want to... Let's get to that world peace as soon as possible. Yeah, world yeah. peace. Don't count on it. Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> counting on it. Okay, and then that's a crazy example. And then here's one last example. And this was the... Was this the same gas leak? No, different. Uh, different. Okay, okay. Um, but what these are are um, oil storage tanks and... Oil storage tanks actually have floating roofs. So if there's a lot of oil in there, the, the roof will be higher and you won't be seeing so many shadows. Mm. If there's not a lot of oil in there, the roof is lower and you can see more shadows. Uh, and there is a company that actually specializes in analyzing the shadows to determine how much inventory is there. Whoa, uh, whoa. That's not us. Yeah. Um, what we're looking for are unusual things. And here, what we found was what appears to be a leak in this particular roof. You can mm -hmm. see how it looks different from these other roofs. And we highlight that here as you've got a problem with this one, which I think unless you were on top of it, you really wouldn't see. A detection of an oil leak. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, there's, whoa, the amount of like applicable cases. I mean, we've went through so many in this conversation, but, and you have a very fascinating way of doing the detection with the historical context and doing the anomaly detection. I think that's so mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, yeah. And, and it really does speed up analysis. And that's what we're hoping for is, is to help the folks who are protecting us, the people who are trying to get anything done, help them understand what's happening. Yeah. Uh, there was a big frog case in Mexico a few years back where people were investing in this um, uh, gated community type construction and it was totally fake. And what? Because if you're outside of Mexico and they're sending you updates, everything's going great. You, you're thinking, okay, I'm, I'm going to have a condo. And when you look at it from the air, there is nothing there. There's nothing being built? Yeah. Oh, whoa. So you can actually observe um, like construction companies and uh, like uh, that are de developers. And yeah. You can see and see if what they're, they're doing. See if that's true, what they're doing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, wow. And companies have development projects going on all over the world. Big companies do. And being able to keep an eye on all of them, 
is something you know that you can now do remotely yeah 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 especially when it could be that the the funds are just being taken and <laughs> and ran with uh instead of actually building but yeah this is the whole trust um thing how many have they previously developed how, how what uh, on timeliness have right. they been able to develop them on how many satisfied thousands of uh of uh homeowners do they have but kind of stuff but now you can find out if they're you know not doing what they're supposed to be doing or, boom uh yeah Bef yeah. Before we close, I'd yes. like to tell you about uh, one of my research use cases. Okay. Um, so we've all heard of the Pacific Garbage Patch. Yes. And it's floating plastic in a gyre in the Pacific Ocean. And it can't be seen from space because the plastic particles are generally fairly tiny. I mean, you'll see big hunks, yes. you know, here and there. But it's not like a giant floating trash island, right? It's just where a bunch of trash kind of accumulates. The, the actual large pieces can be kilometers apart. Okay. So okay. Um, what we want to be able to do with SAR that can at least penetrate the surface of the water and see a different reflection from plastic particles versus what might normally be in the ocean. Um, we want to be able to map and, and track the Pacific Garbage Patch, and I think there's six other garbage patch gyres oh, on the world. the world. Wow. And if you can measure it, then you can tell if you can make it better. Yeah. Right? If Right now, we only have guesses as to how big the Pacific Garbage Patch is, and we yeah. know that it kind of moves seasonally. Yeah. Um, and, and we're trying, there's a number of companies trying to do something about it, but we can't tell how effective they are unless we can actually measure what's going on. Find what's going on, measure the size of the patch, the density of the plastic, and see if it's shrinking or growing and if the mitigating things that people are doing is actually helping. Yes, yes. And so I think that without being able to deserve it, uh, observe it, you can't tell if what you're doing is making any difference. Yeah, yeah. And it's, that's such a good way to put it. It's to measure it, gives you the observational analysis, which gives you the ability to see if the things that you're doing to try and augment it, make it better, are working or not. Exactly. And that can be applied to deforestation or glacial melting or all different types of um, uh, uh, military purposes. Exactly. Is it working? Or what is it, by observing and measuring it, are we, yeah, that's great. And, and, and to use SAR for the Pacific Garbage Passion for all the other ones is, yeah. it's critical. We need to clean that sh up. Yeah. We, we absolutely do. And um, we should be able to track sources as well. If we're looking at the entire ocean, we can see garbage plastic coming from different locations. Oh, that's interesting too. Which countries are contributing most to yeah. the garbage patch and should they then be the ones most responsible for it? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's good. And uh, it, it's going to be hard to clean up because the particles are really small. The particles are small. They've bro broken They've down broken over down. time. They've broken down. The sun yeah. and the, the salt water have broken them down. So yeah. it's a big problem. And we eat them in our fish. We, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we do. Uh, they found a plastic bag at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. They found a plastic bag at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. That's so bad because that's like five, seven miles, seven yeah, miles like down. The, yeah, the yeah, deepest, yeah. the deepest place on the earth. Yeah, there's plastic down there. It's heartbreaking. It really is. So. How the hell did it get all the way down there? Yeah, yeah. It's heartbreaking. It's time to clean that shit up. Yeah, yeah. Liz, this has been so interesting and we're super excited for what Simulator keeps building um, because this is, like you said, we're getting that macro perspective, we're getting the context that we need, the observations that we need. Um, and we're excited to, you know, to sit down again and get an update on what's, been, what's continuing yeah. to be built from you guys. We have a couple quick questions that we like asking our guests on the show. Okay. Okay. First question is, are we alone in the cosmos? I don't see how we could possibly be alone. I, I really don't. Uh, you know, uh, from the Carl Sagan perspective of there's so many planets out there, it just seems highly unlikely, to a fair amount of unexplained incidents being 
well documented by scientists. Uh, I, I definitely think there's out there things out there that we don't know very much about. And then the next question is, are we in a simulation? Simulation theory? That's a really good question. Um, my co-founder, Ray, believes that we are deeply, believes that we are in a simulation. And we should talk to Ray too then. Yeah. Well, yeah, and you know, he's the one with the AI background. And we're like, but the cosmos is so big, how could that possibly be a simulation? And he says, well, you don't actually have to calculate all that. You only have to render what's here. Exactly. Yeah. So he's like, it totally could be possible that we're in a simulation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be fun to talk to Ray about it. Let's make that happen. That's a good yeah, idea. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great idea. And then the last question is, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? So that's a really interesting thing. Um, I'm going to come at it from it, the way I respond emotionally rather than, you know, uh, physical beauty or symmetry or whatever. And quite honestly, I think the most beautiful thing in the world is my two dogs snoring and sleeping comfortably on my bed. And why? I, they seem so content and happy and just listening to those little snuffly snores it it really it, it's one of those spark joy things that um, I find really beautiful and emotionally satisfying for the creatures on the planet to be able to live in that peace and happiness contentness yeah yeah, yeah. Um, a, a number of people in my family are vegetarians and I haven't eaten beef or pork in 35 years um, so I try not to eat things with feelings and I'm learning that chicken and fish have feelings so I'm gonna have to alter my <laughs> diet but yeah we have the clean meat revolution coming we do which is very exciting indistinguishable we do meat yep I'm, I'm really excited for that and it's gonna help us a lot with our conscious as well when we're looking 50 years later the kids will be like what the fuck were you doing slaughtering billions of animals and so yeah yeah looking well forward but to that. we didn't have the technology and i actually i learned something that um was a bit uncomfortable for me uh it, evolutionarily speaking we are only humans because we started eating meat. Mm. So mm -hmm. most of the primates eat leaves, vegetation. You can't get enough energy to power a large brain from eating vegetation. You just can't. You spend most of your day chewing. Exactly. Yeah. And our ancient ancestors started eating meat and got more energy yeah. so that their brains could grow. And Thanks so- Thanks to fire as well. To exactly. To be able to cook that meat, yeah. Exactly, and they got the protein and the fats and everything because our, our brains take up an enormous amount of energy. Yeah. Uh, and so th we would not be human without eating meat. It's kind of interesting. It sure. is, it is. And now we have choices. Yeah, and we have the clean meat revolution come in. Yeah. Liz, Thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been a pleasure. It's been a real pleasure. This Thank is you. super enlightening. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Huge shout out to Ron Vogus for producing and directing. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Check out the links to Similarity.com, also their blog and their Twitter as well. Check out all those links below. Go and have more conversations with your friends, your family, your coworkers, online, on social media. Get talking about AI and satellite imagery and the importance of this subject for the macro perspective of our world. And support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations that you believe in around the world. Support Simulation. Our links are below. Help us continuing to scale and impact more people. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace.